So hopefully uh, everybody is now joining us. Um, if you can hear silence um, for the next couple of minutes, that's fine. Uh, we'll just wait for everybody to join uh, before we do formal introductions. So do not worry um, if you can't hear anything over the next couple of minutes or we'll wait till 12 o'clock before uh, we um, start the session. Cool. The participants are racking up quickly. So uh, lots of people eagerly waiting, which is great to see. Oh, great. Okay. Oh, Guinness glass, I promise there's no Guinness in it. <laughs> Bit early on a Monday morning for that. <laughs> Five o'clock somewhere. Some of our, some of our uh, viewers could be uh, after. Yeah, this is true. Uh, I can see somebody's raised their hand. Um, please use the chat function if you've got any questions or you can't hear. Um, we won't be unmuting people today just because of the sheer volume of people that are on the call. Um, so if you've got any questions, um, you've got Q&A, you've got chat, so please pop it in there. And Daz, if you just want to keep, it, keep an eye out. Yeah, I've got, I've got both of them open. Cool. Nice. Playing at 12. Yeah, I think we've still got people joining, so we'll give it another 60 seconds or so before we, before we kick off. And yeah, just for those that have joined recently, we'll just give it another minute or so before, uh, before we kick off. Um, if anyone's got any issues, please use the Q&A or chat feature uh, for today. Participants are still going up, so we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll give people another 60 seconds or so. Maybe In the meantime. Yeah, in the meantime, why don't we just do a quick intro of, of those who are on the call today. So um, uh, if I start, my name's Mark. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO at HackerJob, um, and I'm going to be hosting today's session. Um, Phil? Yeah, so I'm the head of talent here at HackerJob. Uh, so I obviously work with all the candidates that use our platform, ensure that we've got good supplies for the clients that um, are using us to hire, um, and that our candidates have a, a great experience when they use our system. Awesome. Dale? Hi, I'm Dale. I'm head of product at HackerJob. Uh, so I'm mainly responsible for making sure that we've got a brilliant working website uh, and overall great service for, for you guys. Amazing. And Daz? Uh, I'm Daz. I head up the account management and customer success functions here at HackerJob. Um, so anyone that's currently a client uh, or potential client probably is interacting with me at some point uh, in their journey through HackerJob. Um, just to answer the first question on the uh, on the chat, so yes, this will be recorded, uh, and you can watch it afterwards. Awesome. Um, but participants is still going up, but I think uh, we'll we'll give a quick intro um, into what we're going to cover. Uh, and those that are joining now, um, I'm sure they'll be able to pick it up. So uh, just to check, um, Phil, Darren, Dale, you can see my screen. So if you can see my screen, it means yep. the audience should be able to see yep. my screen. Fantastic. So, um, uh, yeah, so a quick introduction to, to, to what we're planning on doing over the next couple of weeks. So, um, as you all know, um, obviously COVID-19 has fundamentally changed um, the place of work. Um, we've seen a lot of our friends in the industry be furloughed, um, or certainly recruitment teams are less busy than what they were six to eight weeks ago. So, um, we're very fortunate at HackerJob where we've got some very bright minds when it comes to tech. So we thought it'd be amazing to run a two-week program giving everybody an insight into the world of tech. Um, initially, it was designed for recruiters, but it's been shared far and wide. And if you're, don't, if you're not involved in the world of recruitment, it will still be very applicable to you. So we've been absolutely overwhelmed by the response i think the latest count we had about 420 people sign up for this 
um, which is which is incredible. We were not expecting to get to get that response. So um, I guess before we jump into today's session, um, which is going to be an introduction to the process of actually building a product uh, and going through all of the various roles, um, we're just going to do some uh, some quick housekeeping. Um, so first and foremost, um, please be kind. Um, Everybody that is on the call today is managing a full-time job as well, and we are not full-time teachers. I know just how important uh, or what a skill it is to teach because my mum is a, a teacher. Um, so please do be kind, um, but challenge us. The world of technology is, is constantly changing, and we want to apply as much of this as, as uh, possible to the world of recruitment. If we're giving insight that you think you've got a different opinion on, please jump in. We want these sessions to be as interactive as possible. Um, we're catering from beginners to experts, so people that have never hired a technical person in their life, right the way through to seasoned technical recruiters, please stick with it. Today's session is very much an introductory session into the world of technology. So if you've not come across tech before or recruited in tech before, today will give you a really great foundation so that from tomorrow onwards, everyone's starting from the same level. From tomorrow, the sessions will get more technical, um, and we will go deeper into specific areas, um, but um, you, it, will be, it will be relevant for, for everyone that's involved. Um, just to make sure that we cater the content as, as well as possible over the coming weeks, um, there is a poll that you guys can now contribute in, um, in Zoom um, to just give your, your uh, experience in this sector. And a bit of admin, um, you'll be invited a new Zoom webinar link each day. So if you're planning to stick with us for the two weeks, um, please do not use this link again. Uh, you can't do recurring Zoom webinars. So uh, Daisy will send you a new link um, for tomorrow's session. And if you've got any issues, uh, please email Daisy. I think finally, um, if you want to interact with the panelists today, please use either the chat or the Q&A function. Um, we will not be unmuting people from raising hands just because of the sheer volume of the people on, on the call. Uh, but we do want you guys to be involved, so please, please, please use the chat in the Q&A feature. Um, we've tried to make this two weeks as, as fun as possible, so we're running a couple of quizzes. I guess it's a bit of incentive as well uh, for you guys to stick with it. So um, we'll be doing a daily quiz. Um, Darren will post that link into the chat now, um, but I recommend you complete the quiz at the end because it will be on today's content, uh, and I'll give the link again at the end. Um, whoever scores the most points after two weeks wins a £500 Amazon voucher, and we'll share leaderboards throughout the, the, the series so you guys know where you're stacking up. Um, secondly, for a bit of fun um, and to try and build some social engagement, um, when lockdown came in, um, we launched the Hacker Job Wine Club in partnership with the Wine List. Um, so uh, what happens is we send a box of wine to your house um, and it is a box, you get like a couple of different bottles um, and the Wine List will do a, a virtual wine tasting over Zoom. We were very unsure about what the reception would be, but it's been overwhelmingly positive. So we thought it was a great way to celebrate those that managed to complete the majority of this course. We will be organizing a, a special package of wine club. So if you attend six of the nine sessions, you will uh, get a, a two bottles of wine sent to your house um, and we'll run a remote wine tasting as a bit of celebration uh, because, you know, it is tough, challenging times right now um, without using too much of a cliche. Um, so we want to we want to make this as engaging as possible. Uh, final thing from me before we um, jump into today's session is this is the rough agenda for the next two weeks. Um, so like I said, today will be very much a high level introduction. Then tomorrow we're diving into the world of front end development. On Wednesday, we're moving into the world of back end. Um, Thursday, we're going into testing and databases. And then Friday, we're moving into sort of modern software engineering practices. Week two is all going to be on DevOps, probably one of the fastest growing areas within the world of tech right now and, and fascinating. Um, so we're going to focus next week on DevOps. Next Friday is a bank holiday. So as much as we love running these sessions, uh, we'll let everybody enjoy that bank holiday. This is absolutely something we want to keep doing, given the response. So um, Darren will post a link now. You can go and vote for the next course uh, that we, we want to run. That could be on mobile development, on data and data science and data engineering, um, functional development, modern programming languages, whatever you want. So um, please go and vote for the next course and that will shape what we do moving forward. So that's uh, kind of setting the, the groundwork for the next couple of weeks. Um, in terms of today's agenda, we thought a brilliant way to take people through um, the world of, of technology was to explain all of the different roles involved in taking a product from inception through to deployment, actually live in the user's hands. 
Um, this gives you guys a great insight to all of the different skills that are needed um, and the different job titles that you may hear banded about a lot. Um, for the experienced tech recruiters, like I said, a lot of this you will know. Hope there'll be some areas that we touch on today that you don't. Uh, but for people that have never recruited into the world of tech before, this will give you a, a fantastic overview. The panelists that are joining me, for those that didn't catch the intros at the start, we've got Dale, um, our head of product, Phil, our head of talent, and he manages our talent marketplace. Um, so real, real big insight. And Darren, um, our head of account management. So uh, without further ado, uh, we're gonna jump into today's session. Um, and we're gonna kick off with, with the world of product. So um, I think a, a great framework for thinking about how to design a product is, is a concept called design thinking. So I'm gonna hand over to Dale to give a, a bit of an intro into design thinking and this methodology, and then we're gonna jump into the world of product. So hey guys, uh, thanks for joining. So we're gonna talk very quickly about design thinking. Um, also known as either human-centered design or user-centered design. So maybe it's interesting to think about, first of all, um, the way that software used to be um, developed. And so this would often be using a term called waterfalls. So what would happen is business analysts would um, make very long documents describing all the requirements that this piece of software would have to include. Um, project managers would then design a project plan to understand all the different people in the business they would need or contractors or other talent they would need to go and um, deliver that plan um, and then figure out all the timing and handovers. So who needed to be where, when, what was, what was the artifact that needed to be handover through that waterfall process. So a waterfall um, in as much as each work stream would look like a line on the plan and then would then drop down to the next team like that in a waterfall sort of design to be my screen going down. What most teams in software development now are working in a process called Agile or working in short increments. So rather than working on a six or 12 month project, um, they're working on a single product, but improving that product in, in what they call sprints. So normally time boxes are about two to three weeks where they're iteratively improving and releasing um, new versions of the product um, to their users. These teams are cross-functional, so that means that they're not rather in a waterfall world where there's a team of business analysts, then a team of designers, then a team of software engineers working one after the other. The team works collaboratively, um, um, more interactively throughout that process. Um, and so what this um, uh, diagram, and there's a few different versions of this diagram is trying to is explain, is that if you look at the top right, you understand, the need is to really get inside the head of the user. Who is it you're trying to help and what is the problem that they need to, need to solve? Redefine that problem as we go around to the right. Then only at the very bottom start to think about what are the ideas, what are the solutions that might try and solve that problem? Prototype that, that, that problem, test, that, test those solutions out in the market and then build and implement those things. And then the cycle starts all over again. I think the key thing to pull out here is and we'll touch about when we talk a little bit about design in a moment, is those prototypes don't, or those tests and implementations don't necessarily have to be built into fully um, formed application or, or software or code. Um, often I've seen some of the best prototyping is just sketches on paper with post-it notes and the designer or researcher working in tandem with their, with their users as well. So that's a, just a very quick one on design thinking. And I think next, Mark, we're going to do, we're going to talk about product management as well. Great. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for that uh, intro, Dale. So I think just pre I mean, product management can mean um, a load of different things to a load of different people. So one of the reasons we wanted Dale on this call today is Dale has spent the last 10, 15 years of your career, Dale, in, in the world of, uh, of product management in various different roles and companies. So Dale comes with sort of firsthand insight into, into what that um, you know, product process looks like. Yeah, so, so over to you, Dale, on, on product management. Great, yeah. So if we bring up... Um, so I think... What this uh, image um, sort of evokes is the, the, the various um, perspectives that there are about product managers and what they do and what they're good at and why, and why businesses have them in their organizations. Um, um, but ultimately, I mean, I certainly think of myself on a day-to-day -day basis as Superman. Um, but I think the bottom right, I think, really sums it up is that it's a very multidisciplinary role. And so not only do product managers do all do many different things in their day-to-day -day roles, but also there are many different types of product managers. So ones that 
maybe a focus on the day-to-day -day delivery or running of that agile or scrum team, try and get the best productivity out of their team of designers and software engineers, um, to maybe thinking about the marketing or positioning of their new products or um, evolving the, the brand of their, of their business and their products, all the way to like the long-term strategy of the business. So there's, and there's um, product managers doing all of these things independently and overlapping at the same time, depending on the type of organization and business they're working in. Um, I think the other thing to talk about um, product management is that because that multidisciplinary um, state, people often come into it through different um, paths. So some people come in from a software engineering background, often also designers, which, we've, which I've mentioned a couple of times, but also business analysts, project managers, or possibly the marketing um, functions as well. And so the best product managers are able to um, maybe lead in one of those areas, but then score a six or a seven out of 10 in some of those others and, and develop those skills as they develop through their career, hopefully. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, what is it really? Well, um, people often describe product management, if you look at um, blogs like Mind the Product, they talk about being the meeting point between UX, tech, and business. Um, I don't think of it as like the, the glue between those different parts of the organization so your development team your software engineers your designers through to the business so sales and marketing teams um, and ultimately through to your end user who's your client or the user you want to use your product so really important that the product manager understands that and so those top few bullet points looking at having running focus groups sending out surveys getting either feedback either from data analysis so using tools like google analytics or adobe or there's um, also products like Heap that, that we use at um, HackerJob to get quantitative data about our product and how it's performing and how it's helping our users. Um, and then ultimately defining this into a roadmap. So again, just highlighting the difference between the waterfall approach to an agile approach. A product roadmap is similar to a project plan as much as it describes some of the, the, the features or, or products you might decide to build, but it's not fixed in stone like a, like a uh, project plan is which is then subject to change requests in order to change the timelines or the scope or the resource you put into that project. The roadmap is more of a guide or a map to see where you could go. And then it's for the team to figure out collectively how to, how to solve the business objectives of, of, the, of the business. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dow. I think uh, an, uh, an amazing overview into what can be, like you said, quite a broad and complex uh, area, so, so that's awesome. Um, I guess quick question from me on it. Um, obviously you've built many a product in your time. Um, wearing your you know, head of product or, or product management hat, um, what, what's the favorite product you've worked on in, in your career to date? Uh, well, obviously politically I'll say all of the great products that HackerJob offers, but oh, I'll maybe give you an instance from uh, my past. So in a, a previous life, I worked at another um, equipment software company. Um, and we looked at uh, how to service our clients better. So we looked at how to consult them. And so we developed um, uh, some data analysis techniques to allow them to compare themselves to their competitors in the market. Um, um, the thing that I think is really interesting about this, like collecting that data and processing that data and make, understanding it for our client, was a hugely technical challenge. So using all of the skills that, that, that we're gonna talk about through the next few weeks, um, collecting, huge amount of data, so using data science, software engineering, uh, and data engineering to, to deliver it. But ultimately the thing that our clients saw was actually uh, a presentation, so a PowerPoint presentation. So it really shows that um, not all of your products have to be applications or, um, or websites. Um, they can like, be delivered in, in lots of different formats. Amazing. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think it sounds like a, a wicked product and maybe something we should be doing a, a little bit more of a, a hacker job as well. Yeah, so watch this place. <laughs> nice one, Dale. So um, guys, um, people watching, if you've got questions about any of the areas as we run through them, please, please jump in as we go. Some good questions already. Okay, great. Daz is, Daz <laughs> is managing uh, the Q&A. I'm conscious great, of time. Let's go. Up. I'm going to keep quite a good pace to today's session because we've got a lot to cover. But Daz, if we just want to take maybe a question from, from the audience on... Yeah, so on we've, got, we've got a few questions. So Dale, if you keep these succinct. Yep. Um, do product managers generally handle one product at a time or can they work with multiple? Uh, they can work with multiple, absolutely. So, you, so depending on the size of the team or the number of teams that the product manager is responsible for, um, you could be having very deep focus on a single product or feature set 
and you could be working on that feature set for, for weeks and months or even years, trying to optimize it, or auto, and you could be doing, and that product manager could be doing that similar sort of process across multiple teams. So, um, or you could be launching new products iteratively through different work streams. Um, so think about hack job, we have both candidate facing um, a product and client facing products. At the moment, we've got a team that's, that's working simultaneously on, on, on products that affect both sides of the marketplace. Nice, awesome. And Daz, maybe just one more quick one on product? Yep. Um, so what's the difference between a product manager or a product owner? Or are they largely the same thing? Uh, I think they use, you will get different answers depending on who you ask. Um, typically, I think an owner is maybe perceived as slightly more senior within within um, certain businesses, but I'd say broadly speaking, they're used interchangeably. Um, sometimes product management is more about that data running of a scrum team, whereas the product owner is maybe uh, a more, more senior role. But I've seen that interpretation both ways, in fact, depending on the organization. And I think we'll see that throughout the two weeks is so many terms are used interchangeably. There isn't really a clear definition of a lot of these topics and, and terms. So um, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, questions. yeah. And I, and I, and I guess before we kind of move on, there's a lot of good questions going into the Q&A and chat. So what I'll do after this is I'll collate all these questions and we'll find a way to answer all these questions manually, wherever, however we do like a send out. So don't worry, yeah. the will be answered. Absolutely. So what we'll prepare is a summary doc of all the questions that have been answered and, and some answers alongside the video recordings and, and anything else that you guys need. So um, yeah, leave that with us. Um, uh, cool. So uh, that's product management. Um, if we if we stay with Dale, but move on to the world of design, obviously, Dale, you've worked with multiple design teams um, throughout your career. Um, and it seems to be that the world of design has changed quite a lot over the last couple of years, uh, with new roles coming into the market, etc. So I think it'd be amazing for you to just kind of give a bit of an overview of the different roles within within a design function. Yeah, so I've worked in a in a UX design agency previously. And so you can see here with the bullet points, there's these three sort of um, types of roles and, and these roles are often used interchangeably, also using product design instead of maybe UX or, or user experience designer as well. That can mean some or all of these um, parts, but I'll take the top one first. So user research. So I think we talked about trying to understand the user. The job of the user research is either by analyzing data or by actually physically interviewing um, their target users and trying to understand their problems and, and how best we can try and um, uh, solve those. Um, and also sending out surveys. So a mix of quant and qual. Typically these people maybe come from psychology backgrounds at university. So they're really trying to get inside the, the psychology of, of, of users and what they want and what's going to make them happy. We jump down to actually the bottom one. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got user interface design or UI design. These are people that are ultimately responsible for the, for the thing you see. So whether you're looking at an app or a website, what's the choice of colors, the content that's on that page, um, how is it presented, what typeface, what colors do they use, what size of font have they used, how have they arrange those things on the page. Now in between those, so if you think about these on a spectrum, you've got that, what's maybe thought about more as classic UX design, is thinking about what's that process? So what's the task that in a particular feature set of the product that we want the user to complete? What are the, what are the logical steps we want them to do? And what's the order of that? So think about user flows and also then wireframes. So wireframes is a term to describe basically black and white line drawings to very simply understand what is gonna be on the page, what the user does on that page, going from and going from step to step in, in, in a given uh, what we call user flows, so steps in the process of going through your website or through your app, different pages or, or areas of your app. Whereas the UI design is, is, is ultimately responsible for making it look great and really easy to understand. Amazing, uh, awesome overview. And I guess there, are, again, kind of with the product management and product owner, a lot of these titles are used interchangeably as well. Um, when Exactly, it yeah. And I think, so there's one thing I might add then is for your UI design, I think it's, uh, if you're hiring there, it's important to understand because of the background, there's a lot of interchangeable skills with maybe um, print or um, maybe more classic marketing design. So where you're designing banners, um, effectively adverts, um, versus maybe slightly more complex process of designing a, a, a product where you've got lots of um, competing uh, factors. There's a big overlap in the skill set there. So people that have been to art school are using Photoshop, but the way that they 
the and the, the way they use those tools and and the problems they solve with them are slightly different amazing uh guys i, I want to keep a relatively good pace because we've got a few more topics to go through but maybe we can choose uh one question from from the public q a uh around the world of design yep so um question on what happened to the role information architect i haven't seen that role for a while in design yeah so i'd say that sort of sits probably more within that uh ux experience um i'd say in it's more a, a skill set or an artifact that that you that you build um, rather than a role in itself now I think um, the other thing I'd add about this is that increasingly I think you'll see most um, candidates in the market will have at least two out of the three of the of these types of skill sets yep. um, and, and maybe a focus on a particular domain or type of problems so maybe marketing sites or e-commerce as, as a slightly different set of problems to maybe um, enterprise software like Salesforce or something like that, or, or SaaS products as they're called in the, in the market. Awesome. Makes complete sense. Cheers, Dale. Um, and guys, please, please, please keep adding questions. Like I said, we will follow up with, uh, with a summary of all the questions asked and, and our insights into them. Um, I just want to make sure that we, we don't overrun. Um, but awesome. So great start. Thank you so much, Dale. We've looked at Kind of that early phase of design thinking so we, we you know we've, we've got some user insights maybe we, we understand their problem better we're, we're going into design and we've got maybe some wireframes or some user flows um and now we move into the world of development so um Fear and dads are going to take the lead on this side um i think before we jump into front-end development just to make sure that we're not using jargon that uh, people don't understand. Um, I think some key concepts for us to go through um, when we talk about development, maybe Phil, if you just want to give a very high level over to what do we mean when we talk about a programming language? What do we talk when we mean, or what do we mean, sorry, when we talk about um, a framework? And also this concept of open source, which I think will come up quite a bit over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in terms of a programming language, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of similarities to actual language. It's how we communicate, essentially, uh, within software development. Um, so basically, it's a set of instructions and commands that you can kind of create, you can manipulate to create certain outcomes. Um, on a really, really basic level, I don't know if anyone had kind of a MySpace page years ago, um, or WordPress, or any sort of website where you've kind of been customizing it slightly. The very, very simple level is even just put this text in bold is a, is a very, very basic level of, of HTML uh, programming language. Or if you've kind of used SQL queries within a, a database, so whether you've used uh, Excel or Google Sheets or what have you, again, that's very, very, very basic code. So it's using, um, it's using instructions and commands to, to create outcomes. Um, in terms of a framework, so a framework is a set of libraries um, or common functions. So they're essentially shortcuts um, or building blocks which you can use to kind of create an application. So you're borrowing previously written code. So I don't know, every time you want to write, create a search box or um, some sort of new functionality for your website, obviously thousands of developers have written that code before. They've, they've created that, um, that, that kind of end result before. So you can borrow bits of the code that, that they've used. Uh, to, to save yourself a little bit of time. Um, and then open source is basically non-licensed software. So um, a, good, a good kind of a, uh, example is we have closed source uh, software, which basically was Microsoft um, for, for a long time. So C-sharp and ASP.NET, the earlier versions of, of Microsoft's technology were closed source. So you had to license them. You had to pay a license fee each year to use them. Whereas with open source technologies, so Java, Python, various other um, software development languages, uh, they're free to use, but importantly, they're free to add to as well. Um, so Darren's going to come on to JavaScript in a second. Um, when we sort of talk about JavaScript frameworks, there are thousands and thousands on the market. You think of a noun, add JS after it, there's probably a JavaScript framework. So the only reason there are so many is because it's open source and people have been able to add to that, uh, that, that project. Amazing. Great overview. Thank you, Phil. Um, so, Darren, if we jump into actually front end development now, um, do you want to maybe just give um, a very top line overview of front end? And, and for those listening, bear in mind, tomorrow's session is just on front end. So uh, we'll go a lot deeper on this tomorrow. But for those that are maybe completely unaware of what a front end developer is, do you want to give a, a brief overview, Darren? Yeah. So the way that we think about front end in a lot of ways is, is like your face. So it's how is someone interacting with 
um, the particular uh, application or website. So when you're going on to uh, onto a traditional e-commerce website, that's what you're seeing from a front end perspective. Um, within uh, front end, there's several different tools. Um, so if you're looking at HTML, HTML essentially is, it provides a, a set uh, general rules to suggest how content should be um, displayed on the screen. And then CSS is, is more of the look of the web page. So uh, that's looking at, like Phil was talking about earlier with, with fonts and colors, that's what CSS is doing, looking at layouts, et cetera. Then JavaScript is essentially anything beyond that. So scrolls, buttons, features, graphics. Um, at a very high level, that's what we're talking about when we talk about front end and the tools within it. And then within CSS, you have Bootstrap, uh, SAS and, and LESS, which are frameworks in, in the easiest terms. And then JavaScript, these will be terms that anyone that's done any kind of um, front end um, recruitment will be well aware of. React, Angular, Vue, but like Phil said, there's uh, thousands of frameworks within it. So stuff like Meteor or even Ang Angular gets more complicated. We'll go through tomorrow with Angular and then Angular.js. So the Amazing. And, and I guess um, linking it back to what Dale just talked us through around design, you know, obviously elements here that also focus on design. So how does a, a front end developer interact with the, the design team? So essentially what they're doing is, is taking the design elements from that team um, and the concepts and converting them into code. Uh, so uh, me, me and Phil often talk around this, but from a, uh, from a well-rounded front end developer perspective, they will have an element of design in their background as well. Although they're two different disciplines, they kind of fall one in, one in not one in the same, but there's a lot of um, crossover between the two. Awesome, okay, great. And, and as mentioned, oh, sorry, Daz. Just seeing if there's any uh, questions in the, uh, in the chat as well that we can go to. Yeah, yeah, and, and as mentioned, we, we, we've got a whole hour on front end development tomorrow, so uh, we'll, we'll definitely dive in deeper, especially into the world of JavaScript, which is probably the most important programming language in the world now. Um, but yeah, Daz, any, any Q and A's? Maybe we can take one, just looking at, uh, looking there's at- There's not them. a lot of Q and A's on that. There's a lot going back to, uh, to the previous conversations on open source. So we'll make sure we, uh, we get those answered people going forward. Nice, nice, nice. And yeah, if we've got time at the end, we'll, we'll jump into some open source stuff. Cool, so that's front end development, very much the, the look and feel of, a, of an application. Um, if we jump into sort of back end development, um, Phil, do you wanna give us uh, a bit of an overview of what we mean when we talk about back end? Yeah, um, so if the front end is the face, then, then the back end is the brain. And we'll, we'll come on to a, a kind of more complete analogy in a second. Um, but it's basically the logic. It's, it's, the, it's the commands that you've written. So when we were talking about language being a, a set of commands and instructions, it is the library of commands and instructions that you've written to instruct the program how to act. So it takes a request from the user, it retrieves the information from the database, and it provides a response back to the user. So the user clicks, the back end uses the logic to retrieve the data and then obviously that provides a different end result on the interface where it loads the next page or it gives you a drop down or whatever it is that you're <coughs> you're trying to do um, within back end development there's broadly four different disciplines there are millions of sub disciplines within these so please don't think this is an exhaustive list um, but web development which is essentially browser-based development so um, you've obviously got various different websites across uh, not just your, your, your kind of desktop browser, but mobile friendly versions as well. So as you can imagine, it's very, very popular. Uh, desktop applications, again, what you'll typically see on your, your homepage when you're opening up your, your Mac or your, um, or your, or your Windows computer. Uh, mobile applications, which again, what it says on the tin, it's what you'll find on your Android or your iOS typical uh, device. And then embedded uh, backend development, which is typically uh, Internet of Things. So if you've got an Apple Watch, if you've got a smart toaster, whatever it is, um, it'll probably have some embedded software in there. So it's software that's embedded within a specific piece of, uh, of, of, of tech. Amazing. Um, makes complete sense to And I think um, perhaps worthwhile, um, these are probably all um, sort of buzzwords that you know, people have heard of in the past, but maybe just talk us through you know, those four core areas. What, what are the different technologies that are likely to be used? Yeah, uh, so within web, again, this isn't an exhaustive list. I think we see at the moment, uh, Node.js is very popular. Uh, Java is very, very popular. 
Whenever you're looking at survey data, you'll see that Python is the most popular language. However, that's because Python's very, very diverse. So it's used within data, it's used within a lot of different kind of uh, disciplines. So actually when it comes to web development, it's not quite as popular, I'd say, as, as kind of Node.js, uh, Java, even PHP is, is very popular at, uh, at the moment. Um, within desktop applications, C Sharp, so you've got WPF and WinForms, uh, which are kind of the desktop version of, uh, of desktop creation tools within uh, C Sharp, that, that's used very heavily. Uh, within mobile development, so you have um, hybrid languages and you have native languages. So you have languages that are native to iOS, and then you have hybrid languages that you can uh, deploy applications on both iOS and Android phones. So Swift would be a, uh, an, an iOS native one, um, Java Android SDK would be uh, Android native, whereas you've got React native, which actually uses JavaScript. So it's borrowing some front end uh, technology to, uh, to kind of wrap up your code and allow it to work on either an iOS or an Android device. So you can deploy your application to the Google Play Store as well as uh, as well as the, the the Apple Store as well. So um, obviously very sought after these days. And then within embedded systems, uh, C and C plus plus are probably the most common. This is like their main use these days. Um, but you do see a, a lot of Python as well. Amazing. Cheers, Phil. Nice. Cool. And yeah, I said. Do you want to give us a, a quick summary in a couple of the. Oh. Go for yeah. it, Phil. So I said we'd jump onto this, this analogy. So again, if the face is, is the front end, it's showing the emotions, it's, it's showing the end result. Um, the brain is, is computing all of that, and the database is, is your memory. Um, so if you're looking at the human, the human body, that's the kind of flow within front end and back end development. You click on the front end, sends a message to the back end, which extracts the right information from the database, and then sends uh, a signal back to the front end to, to change that interface. Um, and I think someone touched on this in the chat actually, but yes, front end plus back end equals full stack. Um, so if you are working with JavaScript, um, but you're also working with Java, chances are you are suitable for a full stack role. However, it's very important to obviously chat to the, the candidate you're speaking to and make sure one, they're comfortable with that. They may have a preference for front end or back end and two, how much have they been using uh, the various technologies within their role because they may have very briefly touched on it they have it on their tech stack on their CV, but it's not necessarily their forte. Amazing. And Daz, have we, have we got any questions on any of the, the front end or back end piece from, um, from, from the audience? So Phil, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you a really challenging question. <laughs> Node, no, Node where, does it, uh, where does it fit in, front end or back end? Uh, yeah, so interesting. So Node.js is essentially the back end version of uh, JavaScript. So you can use Node.js uh, to create back end logic, very popular within web development. However, just to be even more confusing, uh, within Node.js, you then have things called compilers. So you've got NPM, Grunt, Webpack, things like that, which you can then use Node.js to then flip it back to some front end uh, functionality. So uh, primarily it sits on the back end, um, but you can use it to do front end as well. So yeah, Node, Node's a little bit of a murky world, but I'm sure you'll do a great job of explaining that in more depth tomorrow on yep. the front end version. Cool. And then one quick uh, second question. Where does Perl fit in to this uh, in terms of like code? So obviously we didn't mention Perl, but Perl's a oh. friend language. Ah. Kind of a lot. And, and Phil, it might be worth just maybe giving, uh, there's probably a few legacy technologies that we'd probably consider Perl as as well that we probably haven't covered. So yeah, maybe worth just giving a, a bit of an overview of Perl and, and any of the other legacy tech that people in organizations might still use, but isn't necessarily a go-to tool for any new products. Yeah, well, I think the the digital transformation kind of revolution over the past few years has, has, has massively increased the prominence of web related tech. Every company out there has a website. Every company with any sense is trying to digitally transform. You want all your transactions online. You want all your business development online. You want to be able to interact online. Um, whereas not every company has an embedded product or an app or a, a desktop uh, product. So, um, web, web technologies are very much the, the most popular at the moment, um, but yeah, you do have some legacy technologies. So you've got Perl, um, which is a, a legacy backend, um, backend language that, to be honest, is falling out a little bit of favor. It just doesn't have the functionality that, say, a Java does or a Python does. Um, you've got COBOL, which, again, is a very old language, which is mainly used for kind of uh, infrastructure mainframes. So it's kind of embedded. Um, but it's, it's basically embedded when computers were as big as your house. Um, 
and you've got essentially C as well. C is a, a, an old language. Uh, it still has a lot of use within embedded technology, but it's not typically used for anything but embedded. Um, and even within the, the popular languages, you have their, their legacy kind of uh, antecedents. So you've got uh, VB.net, for example, within C Sharp, Visual Basic, that is um, not very popular these days. Typically, everything's moved towards either AS, ASP.net um, or .NET Core, which is by far the most kind of sought after. Or uh, within Java, you've got JEE, which is Java Enterprise Edition, which again, um, has kind of fallen out of favor because modern Java um, is typically anything version eight and above, um, eight up to 12, I think, but it's so hard to keep up with, they come out so often. Nice, and I appreciate you covered a lot there, Phil. We'll make sure all of that's included in the wrap up afterwards um, because uh, tons of really interesting insight there. And I think just to build on what Phil said there is, whilst they may be considered legacy technology, some organizations absolutely still will use them. Um, there's also proprietary programming languages um, where basically organizations build their own language, which can also make hiring slightly challenging, uh, but we'll probably come on to that uh, as we go through the course. Um, so if that's uh, kind of software development, just checking the clock. Yeah, we're good. We've got 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> we'll rush so, through this next part. Uh, so QA and test. So if we just take a step to reflect on, on what we've done so far when we look at design thinking. So um, we've um, spoken to our users. We understand their problem and their pain in, in really great depth. The design team have turned that into wireframes, um, maybe some UI elements uh, with specific colors and, and, and elements like that. The front end team have then taken all of that design work in, and translated it into code. So it's now a, an application that you know, a user could go and click and use. The back end team have then built all of the logic behind that application. So when you click a button, as Phil explained, it will go and retrieve the information from the database and display that back to the user. So, We've gone on this journey so far, and now we introduce QA and test. So, Darren, do you want to give a, a brief overview of, of what we mean when we talk about either quality assurance um, or testing? They're used interchangeably. Yeah, sure. So, um, testing in its most uh, highest form essentially is looking at a, a piece of software, application, website, <clears throat> whatever it, it may be, and testing it to make sure that from a user perspective it functions properly so within test you've got a couple of different areas so you've got manual um, you've got automation and then you've got SDEP. they're the three typical QA types that you'll see so what a manual tester is doing is intimating user behavior manually so they'll be clicking through websites um, utilizing a human approach to, to everything um, whereas an automation tester will be using um, frameworks and, and scripts that are already designed for them to test the, the software itself using technologies like Selenium and, and Specflow. And then the software developer in test is actually developing and building those test frameworks from scratch. Um, as anyone that is um, in that four years plus that we've got in the poll will know, uh, find an Esther in the market right now, they're, they're absolute unicorns as we put on the, um, on the slide. Um, so I'd love to hear what people are doing to, to get around this problem um, at some point. Yeah, I think on, on Thursday, we're going to go deep into the world of, of QA and test. Um, as well as looking at different types of databases. So um, any challenges you guys have got, please get in touch with them and we can include them in Thursday's session. I think that is one, one thing we've not touched on, um, which um, might confuse some people, but some people might have some questions around it, is, is the process that a software developer goes through to test their code. So when we talk about stuff like unit testing versus what the quality assurance team do when they, when they test code. Do you want to just talk through maybe the difference between sort of unit testing by a software developer and, and maybe one of these types of testing from a, from a QA engineer? Yeah, so we're going to go into a lot more detail on it tomorrow. So I don't want to uh, put too much confusion into it because it's got its own section tomorrow. But from a unit testing perspective, but unit testing is exactly what it says on a team, tin, where you're testing a minuscule amount of, uh, of code at its smallest kind of level, whereas a, a QA tester or um, a oh. information tester or an SDET they'll be testing the entire functionality of the, uh, of the application. So we'll go into it with further detail tomorrow, but that's essentially the difference between it. Majority of clients that we work with and majority of companies on the market will still have a text testing function despite the innovation of um, new concepts like unit testing and TDD, for example. Amazing. Yeah, I'm excited to dive into that on Thursday. And I think we'll touch it on Friday in the modern software engineering yeah, part as well. Definitely. 
Um, cool. Uh, any questions from the audience on cool. Q and test? Let me just go back. Apologies, doing multiple. Uh, Fine. So there's a question on: Can you briefly explain te how testing fits into dev practices, e.g., TDD? Is it a separate function, or uh, are the engineers doing this? So uh, yes, you kind of jumped into kind of what we're going to be going from on Thursday. Um, but again, the majority of clients we work with um, will be utilizing TDD. How deep they go into TDD is questionable. Like it's an interesting concept in the market. Um, that when you look at how companies are utilizing TDD, are they doing it at the, at the base level all the time? We can kind of discuss that on, on Thursday. But yes, the, um, essentially most clients, like I say, will be using um, the developers to develop their own unit tests, but also have a testing team. Yeah, I think there's, we, we see very few businesses that have decided to take the approach of no QAs. Definitely has happened. I think TransferWise did it for a long time. I don't know if they still do. I remember reading a blog post on them back in the day um, to say they didn't have any software testers. They expected their devs to test all of their own code. So definitely can happen, but I think common practice is we'll still see devs take some of that testing ownership, but there will definitely still be that QA team, which probably actually leads us really nicely on to, to the world of DevOps and, and how automation testing is actually impacted the world of DevOps. Now, um, Phil's got the very difficult job of explaining DevOps very briefly um, because it is a big topic and, and quite complex, uh, but we will be spending the whole of next week on DevOps because it's one of the most important concepts within the world of tech at the moment um, and there's so much to cover. So, um, Phil, I'm going to give you the unenviable task of uh, giving a, just a brief intro into, into what the world of DevOps is uh, and maybe we can also run through a couple of the key themes and, and areas within DevOps as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if QA is kind of focused on quality and speed with emphasis on the quality, uh, DevOps is focused on quality and speed with emphasis on the speed, but obviously still maintaining that, that level of quality. So um, it's a combination of software development and technology operations um, aimed at reducing the software development life cycle. So um, it's basically process as well as actual kind of uh, tech. So whether that's coding or cloud technologies or whatever it is, it's kind of the, the, the merge of those two, um, the, those two previously separate disciplines. So um, DevOps is very cloud focused. Uh, anyone who's sourced for any DevOps engineers will know typically that you'll be focused on uh, people that have certain uh, cloud technologies, so whether that's Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, Google cloud Platform tend to be the, the most popular three. Um, and that's because what DevOps is, what it's allowing you to do is constantly deploy new features without kind of breaking your existing system. So I, if I cast my mind back about four or five years, I used to get a text from Barclays probably every six months to say that their systems would be down for 24 hours because they were having to um, implement some new features and new fixes, things like that. I don't get those anymore. <clears throat> and the main reason behind that is the DevOps culture that's kind of uh, grown over, over, over that time. Um, so if you're working on a new feature, you don't want to just deploy it right into your live system um, because, you know, that new feature might break your live system. If you're IBM or if you're a, you know, a huge global business, even an hour's downtime could be dramatically, uh, could cost you a lot of money, essentially. Um, however, if you, you obviously want to be able to iterate as well. You want to be able to build new features and deploy them into your current system because that's the nature of tech. So how do you marry those two things up? So you create a cloud container, which is basically um, you replicating your, your existing system within a cloud, uh, within a, a kind of container on the cloud. It's a little sandbox. You can play around with things. You can break things. It's not going to affect your live system, which is why you need, um, you need the cloud, essentially, for a, a DevOps culture. Um, once you've got your, your live system in there, you've got your new feature, you want to kind of make sure that they work, you then need to go through your configuration management process. Very simple analogy I kind of have for this is if you imagine you've got a jigsaw with one piece missing, the configuration management process is making sure that this piece fits into your jigsaw. Um, so once you've done that, yes, you make sure that it's exact same shape, it plugs into your existing system, it's not going to break anything, everything works. You then need to move on to your continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline or CICD will be what you'll see on a lot of CVs. And it is essentially a pipeline. So it's a series of automated build tests that are already built into the pipeline. Um, it does go alongside 
something called BDD, Behavior Driven Development, or Behavior Driven Design, Driven Design, which we'll come on to next week as well. But essentially, you, you put your new feature into one end of that pipeline, it goes through the tests. If they're happy with it, it all works, boom. That's deployed into your live system. All your end user has to do is hard refresh their browser, and there we have it. They've got the new feature there, they've got the new page, whatever it is. Um, so it's really seamless, and it allows companies to constantly be adding to their products and their websites. Amazing. Thank you so much, Phil. Uh, and if that was uh, went straight over people's heads, like I said, we're going to spend the whole of next week on DevOps. So we'll take each of these topics on a daily basis and dive into a lot more depth. Um, I guess quick question from me, Phil, you know, the concept of the cloud, um, you know, a lot of people will be familiar with. Um, but I guess just give us kind of like the history. Why was it so significant? Um, you know, such a significant milestone, I guess, for software development um, with the concept of the cloud. Obviously, AWS made it or commercialized it in, I don't know, when, 06, 07. But wh why was it such a significant leap forward for, for software development practices? Yeah, so obviously lots of different reasons, but I think if you could boil it down to two main reasons, one would be kind of what I've just covered. Um, you've got massively increased computer power, massively increased computer storage with that with being able to host data on, on the cloud, um, which allows you to deploy new features quicker and all of that, all of, all of, all of those things that go along with, with DevOps. Uh, but on a more basic level, it allows you to automatically update your system using the cloud. So you don't have to buy CD-ROMs anymore. You don't have to buy floppy disks if we want to go back even <laughs> just to upload new, new, um, new uh, programs or to update things. You can do that directly from the cloud. And again, you know, if anyone's got a PS4 out there, there's no going out and buying a disc anymore like you would have had to back in the day for your PS1 or 2. You just download your new game instantly. So if you imagine that concept applied to tech across the world, it's, you know, it, it, it's absolutely um, unfathomable how much impact that it, it has had, just the ability to share data um, and to host things on the, the cloud. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we will include a roundup of, of today's topics. But I think um, a great series of books, if anybody wants to read further on, on these topics, is uh, called MIT Essentials. So MIT, um, obviously, top, top uni in the States, have written these brilliant sort of 100 page books um, that give a really great um, introduction to, to different technical topics. So they've got a brilliant book on cloud computing. Uh, they've got a brilliant book on artificial intelligence that as a non-technical person, you can pick up read it in a, in a matter of hours and get a really thorough overview. So we'll make sure we include some links to those afterwards. Um, so um, Daz, I'm conscious we've got 10 minutes left, so we won't do Q and A's on DevOps, though I imagine there might be a few, but we will, we will save all of them and use them towards our content next week. Sure. Um, There's probably one thing we want to mention, because I've had a couple of questions in the Q and A about what is a unicorn? <laughs> um, it's a term that we use a hack job all the time, but I appreciate that not everyone will know what we're talking about when we're talking about unicorn. I don't know if you yeah. want to, Mark or do you want me to? <laughs> Great question. Well, so what is a unicorn? A unicorn is a um a magical creature that doesn't really exist. Um so um in the world of technology startups, a unicorn is obviously a business that is worth uh, a billion dollars or a billion pounds. Uh, when we apply the word unicorn, we mean a skill set that's really challenging to find. So Dale touched on it with design. So a unicorn in design would be somebody that's got a really nice balance of user research, UX design, and user interface skills. Um, in, in testing, uh, a unicorn is what we would call a software developer in test or an SDET because they're expected to be uh, as good a software engineer as the, the, the software engineering team, but they solely work on test. Um, I think Skype made it a very popular role 10, 15 years ago. Um, so uh, that's what we mean by unicorn, sort of a magical, uh, a magical human that is incredibly hard to come across. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, nice question though. Um, cool. So Daz, um, again, very challenging task to do a very brief summary of data science. So the initial plan was that we would cover data science in this two weeks, but we've lost a day uh, with, with the bank holiday next Friday. And we thought better to take things slow and go deep than try and cram too much into this two week period. So there is that whole running for you guys to be able to vote for which course you want us to do next. Um, I would love us to do something deeper in data science because it is a fascinating world. Obviously, the biggest buzzword probably in tech right now is artificial intelligence. So it'd be amazing to dive deeper into that. But Darren, do you want to give us maybe just a 60 second overview into the world of, of data science at a very high level 
uh, before we before we move on. Sure. So um, data, massive, like uh, Mark says, massive little market out there. When well, I say little, huge. Um, but essentially, what happened with the data was an explosion with the introduction of, of big data. So if you look at a PNG um, right now, it's the same size as what NASA used to launch the rocket uh, to the moon. So everything is changing in that side. Um, but also the uh, from before we were looking at like a gigabyte you'd be um, analyzing that. Now you, you're talking about terabytes. So um, that has meant that we now need people who specifically look after this area. When we're talking about structured and unstructured data, so um, you're looking at relational databases, which is like SQL, MySQL focused, which is columns, tables, rows, and then you've got unstructured data. And unstructured data essentially is non-rational, if you see that word, and it's looking at in the most basic terms is looking at data structures that don't relate to rational databases, i.e. columns, tables, and rows. Um, and you would often use this for speed purposes, but we'll go into a lot more detail on that during the, the Thursday uh, database session. And then from a data science perspective, um, so data scientists are essentially gathering insight from user behaviors, utilizing tools like R, um, SQL, Tableau, and what they are, so imagine it going on onto an e-commerce website, you're clicking through the buttons and they're looking at the behaviors. So over time, what will happen is they'll use your behaviors to, uh, to siphon you to other uh, items that may be of interest to you. At the most broad, uh, basic terms, that's kind of what data scientists do. But like Mark says, it is a massive topic. So I would love for that to be the next um, topic we do once we get through these sessions. Awesome. Thanks, Daz. Um, and I think if we, we apply um, those last two principles of, of sort of DevOps and data science back to our design thinking and, and kind of go through that journey again, you can imagine that um, uh, the product guys and girls are, you know, gathering insights from our users, understanding their problem and what their pain point is. The design team then translate that into wireframes and user journeys the front end team take those design elements and convert them into code, into, into web pages or, or mobile apps, or whatever it might be. The back end team build the logic, the brain of an application um, and, and how uh, it actually works. You've then got the QA team um, to, to test it, make sure it does what it says and it doesn't have bugs. Um, the DevOps team then deploy that application um, so that it is now visible to the public. And then data science is all about gathering that petabytes of data and, um, and uh, running different algorithms and analysis on top of it to gather insights. Um, and as Dale outlined at the start, very iterative process. So that was a lot to fit in in, in 56 minutes. So um, hopefully uh, we didn't fly through, through things too quickly. Um, the real purpose of today's session was just to get everyone's baseline knowledge to a, to a similar standard. Um, uh, as mentioned, we have a, a quiz, um, and uh, so it's 10 questions, 10 minutes. There's a, a bit.ly link there to make it as easy as possible to go to, but uh, Daz also posted it in chat, and maybe Daz, if you want to repost it in chat now, um, just so that people have got the link to the quiz. Um, there is a £500 Amazon voucher up for grabs, so, you know, dive in um, uh, and give it your best shot. Today's quiz is an entry level quiz. So uh, I want lots of eights, nines, and tens on today's quiz. Um, and no teasing. In terms of tomorrow's session. Pardon? I said no cheating as well. Don't, don't Google the answer. Oh. No cheating. Yeah, it's quite funny. I was doing a pub quiz on Friday and someone said, How do you know we're not all cheating? And I was like, Well, that's the basic point. Come on, guys. Like, Nobody likes cheaters. Um, so um, in terms of tomorrow's session, um, we're going to you know, ramp it up a little bit and go deeper into, into different areas. So tomorrow's going to be all on front-end development. Um, 12 to 1 on Zoom again. Um, please bear in mind there will be new Zoom details. And tomorrow's structure will be slightly different. So we'll probably spend around half an hour on the technical topic of front-end development. We'll then spend about five to 10 minutes on some recruitment insights. So we'll give you guys some salary data, most in demand skills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we want to finish it up with some real life challenges that businesses are facing in the front end world. 
So we've already had a couple submitted um, on LinkedIn. Uh, but um, if you, your business has got a challenge, like I said, it'll be completely anonymous, but we want to be able to kind of apply the technology to the world of recruitment. So uh, we want to balance that uh, as best as we can. Um, I think the final thing for me is obviously this is our first session of doing this. Um, I'm sure you can all understand the challenges of keeping hundreds of people engaged for an hour running through technical topics. We want your feedback. So please, please, please email Daisy. Um, her email address is on the screen. Um, please be honest with us. We want to know what we can do better, um, what's been valuable, um, and what else we can, we can do. So, um, yeah, please, please send any feedback over to Daisy. Um, we will follow up um, with an answer sheet to all of the Q&As that have been submitted. Plus, we'll share the deck. Uh, plus, we'll share the video. Um, so, uh, tons of content for you to go away and read. Um, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, very, very excited to do tomorrow's session on front end. So we'll see just, you at 12. Just quickly, Mark, because uh, we mentioned in the chat, how will people get access to tomorrow's session? The link will be sent out. Ah, great question. So as Daisy has sent you a, the Zoom details for today, you'll get that uh, another email. I don't know if it comes from Daisy or directly from Zoom uh, with just new details. So it'll be directly to your email exactly how you got the details for today. Nice one. Any other questions in the, in the Q&A chat, guys, that I should pick up before we drop no, off? There's a lot, of, a lot of questions on how can they get a copy of it. Um, I believe Daisy will be uh, forwarding on uh, copies of this slide and all the other slides going forward. Um, yes. Let's say tomorrow. I'll, I'll catch up with her on that. Yeah, we will we'll send an email. So to whatever email you've registered, guys, uh, we will send a pack of the deck, the video, Q&A sheets, um, as well as any further reading, as I know I mentioned a couple of books as well. Lovely. Awesome. On that note, thank you so much for joining and we will uh, see you again tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Now I've got to work out how you stop, uh, <laughs> stop the process. So let's see how we can do this. For those still joining, uh, this is real-life technical issues. Leave uh, uh, meeting. Oh. Right. Yeah, I can just leave me in. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks, guys.